morning, everyone. The reading today is 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 5, and then 13 to the end. Concerning the, com- the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching alleged from us, whether it be a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, assessing that the day of the Lord has already come, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawless is revealed. The man doomed to destruction, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he may set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? 13 now. But you ought to always be thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to serve through the sanctuary word of the Spirit and through the belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that we might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we pass on to you, whether by word or mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loves us and by his grace gives us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. This is the word of the Lord. As Helen brings God's word to us, let's pray for her. Father, we thank you for Helen. Thank you for the word that you have placed on her heart. Pray that you would be open in our hearts and minds to hear from you this morning. Pray that you would anoint her lips and anoint the words. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you. Uh, This morning's reading is another one of Paul's letters. This time it's to the church in Thessalonica, which city which still exists. It's actually the second biggest city in Greece, and it's at the top of the Aegean Sea in sort of northern Greece. So let's have a bit of background. Paul had visited the area some months before he wrote the letter, and he set a church up there. He'd had to leave quite quickly because of persecution. He'd only been able to stay three weeks. Nevertheless, the church was growing, And he remained connected to them, hearing reports from others and sending Timothy to strengthen them. So following Timothy's visit, he wrote his first letter to the church there. That's probably one of the first letters he wrote. Commending them for their faith and expressing his his joy at their progress. And he also answered some of their questions, including questions about what will happen to believers who've already died when Jesus comes again. It's not long, though, that Paul's relief at their progress turns to frustration and dismay when he receives further reports. And it's his response to these reports that causes him to write his second letter, which includes today's reading. It seems that what he taught them when he was with them has been distorted and it needs correction. And his words in verse 5 sum this up. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? So what was it that had gone wrong? It seems that some of the church family had come to believe that Jesus' return was imminent. And so given up their day jobs, meaning that they were sponging on the rest of the believers. There was obviously some confusion, and Paul accuses them of being deceived by listening to false teachers. And he seeks in his letter to correct their thinking. That's not so very different today. People throughout time have been looking at the world, at the Bible, at other ancient writings, and trying to make sense of when it will all end. 
Now, these are just some of the predicted dates that I've found on the internet for the end of the world or Jesus' return or the second coming. Um, they're not necessarily from Scripture all the same thing, but we'll, we'll say they are at the moment. You'll see that some of these have already passed and there are quite a lot in the future. Take note of the middle one, though. This December. So perhaps we don't need to worry about Brexit or an election after all. <laughs> We'll wait and see. But people throughout history have attempted to predict the dates, and here's a couple of examples. So there were people called the Millerites, who were followers of the American Baptist preacher William Miller, and they became convinced that the end of the world had been predicted in Daniel, uh, chapter 8, verse 14. And after a few false dawns, the date was set as October 22nd, 1844. That day is now known for obvious reasons as the Great Disappointment. And uh, the world will end in 2060, according to, St. I to, to Sir Isaac Newton. He is the English physicist and mathematician, and he also used the book of Daniel to come up with the date, according to his 1704 letter. And I don't know if you caught on the BBC News just about a month ago or so, a family who spent nine years on a farm waiting for the end of time, had been discovered by police in the Netherlands after one of them turned up at a local pub. But history marches on, and we're all still here. So as you know, today is Remembrance Sunday, when we remember especially those who have died or suffered in conflicts around the world. And it'd be no surprise if people thought the end of the world was close when they were involved in this all this, all this, we have no idea, do we? And there are ongoing conflicts around the world today, as well as natural disasters, which must feel like the end is coming to those caught up in it. Many Christians are so dismayed at what's going on that they are actively praying, come Lord Jesus. And it was common in the early church to believe that Jesus was coming soon. So how did Paul help the young believers to make sense of what was going on around them, especially with some conflicting teaching? And the key, I believe, is in verse 15 of today's reading. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teaching we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. And as we read our Bibles in church today, this is Paul's message to us. So then, Christ Church, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter, or today in our Bibles, read on our own, in our home groups, or taught to us on a Sunday morning. So the Thessalonian Church didn't have access to our New Testament, and they had to rely on Paul's teaching, which had been received from God himself. But we do have the privilege of having free access to Bibles, and that's the teaching that we have received and should stand on. Now, I'm not going to do a theological study of the end times. It's known as eschatology, if you want to know. Uh, theologians are still arguing about it. But let's take a brief look at what Jesus teaches about his return. He does give us some signs. But most of these have been common throughout the ages, such as wars and rumors of wars. And Paul writes to the Thessalonians about the man of lawlessness. And many would say that the man of lawlessness is alive and well on our streets today. But the end has not yet come. So we can't pin everything on those signs to help us predict Jesus' return. But he is clear about two important points. In Matthew 24, he says, But about that day or hour no one knows not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. A bit later on in the same chapter, he says, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So whenever that day is, we as believers must be ready. 
And Jesus reinforces this with a number of parables as well as with his direct teaching. So we can learn from Jesus himself through his words in our Bibles that although there may be signs of the end of the age which we can potentially read, the main point is that we don't actually know when these things will happen, but we must be ready by walking closely with God and doing our best to give others the opportunity to know Jesus so they can be saved for eternal life. Let's get back to what was happening in Thessalonica. Some of the believers were certainly getting ready as they'd given up work. This was clearly contrary to Paul's teaching to them. And one of the reasons that he felt he had to write quite, quite a stern letter to them. Others had come into the church bringing their own ideas of what was going on. And some of the Thessalonians had listened to them. Paul's antidote to their misunderstanding is that they must hold fast to the teaching they'd first received. And this is really where I want us to take us now this morning. So let's imagine that Dean, as he leads a service here at Christ Church, tells us this. I went to a great conference last week, and I reckon the speaker was right when he said that the end of the world is imminent. So I've decided to give up work at Sixth Form College and spend my time in prayer and contemplation. It's a bit tricky, though, to run my car, so if you don't mind, I'll be asking all of you for a contribution. Now, hopefully, at this point, Tim would interrupt, or Chris would take him aside at home group and remind him about a wonderful talk he'd heard at New Wine. Now, this is a fairly obvious one, but it might not be as obvious as this. Some things that can lead us astray are very subtle. How do we handle such things? What should we do when we hear our brothers and sisters talking about things which are clearly off-key and not supported in God's word? And in these circumstances, we should do what Paul tells the believers in Thessalonica to do, to hold fast to the teachings that have been passed on to us and to help others to do the same. So many of Paul's letters in our Bible address issues that have arisen in the churches because false teachers have either been distorting the gospel message or adding to it. And this is a huge concern to Paul. In Galatians, he gets really stroppy, calling them, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And imagine Tim standing up here and speaking to us like that. But his concern was justified. The believers in that church had been infiltrated by religious people who were insisting that they had to do things to earn salvation rather than receiving it as a gift of grace by faith. They were in danger of losing their salvation. No wonder Paul thought it was so important to correct them. It's not so very different today. It can be really hard to stick to the truth of God's word when we are bombarded on every side by endless media stories, YouTube talks, fake news, social media, other religions, the celebrity culture, dodgy science. We can easily be taken in by clever people giving their take on how to live life today. I find it quite astonishing that a young woman can have 1.2 million followers by about makeup, <laughs> about talking about makeup and giving people an hour by hour account of her daily activities. And while we might be able to resist her take on life, we need to be more careful about what we watch on God TV or listen to on the internet or on other similar platforms. Not all the teaching is sound. So there are a number of common errors or heresies around in the church today. The first one is that you can earn your salvation. This is like the Galatian church that Paul wrote to. That there is something other than union with Christ that is necessary for salvation. And according to a recent study in America, 36% of self-identified evangelicals believe that by the good deeds that I do, I partly contribute to earning my place in heaven. And this is the same belief as the false teachers held in Paul's day. Any belief which holds our good deeds or efforts contribute to salvation is a heresy. It's like saying that what Jesus, done is not good, Jesus has done is not good enough. And Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 8, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God 
Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. The second sort of error is a prosperity gospel thinking. The belief that if you are a true believer, then you will always be healthy and wealthy. And this is an article quoted uh, from, in an article quoted from prosperity gospel teacher Kenneth Hagen, whoever he is. Uh, he'd been right at home with the Corinthian church, which is another church that Paul wrote to. This teacher says, I believe that it is the plan of God our Father that no believer should ever be sick. It is not, I state boldly, it is not the will of God my Father that we should suffer with cancer and other dread diseases which bring pain and anguish. No, it is God's will that we will be healed. The writer of the article counters this view by saying, The problem, as Paul taught the Corinthians, is that such thinking is only true in the age to come. There is no crown without a cross. This modern iteration of an ancient heresy is deadly. It harms those who are suffering. It detracts from the gospel and breeds cynicism when promises which God never made do not come true. There is simply no basis in scripture for the prosperity gospel. In fact, most of Jesus' teaching about money is negative, and there are plenty, plenty of examples of righteous people in the Bible suffering poverty or disease. third one I want to look at is called universalism. And this is the idea that everyone will go to heaven eventually, regardless of their belief or conduct. So again, it's absolutely not supported by Scripture. But the truth can make us feel very uncomfortable. It's not a nice thought that not everyone will be joining us in heaven. But it's so important that we know what the Bible says and don't make up what we want to hear. And among other passages, you only have to read John 14, 6 to see what Jesus is saying. It says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Sadly, many of these views come from within the church. I don't know how many funerals you've been to where the minister reassures the congregation that it will, they, they will all one day be reunited with their loved ones, or that someone who has consistently denied the existence of God is now in heaven. We can understand that the minister wants to provide comfort at a time of grief and distress, but ultimately people are being given false hope it denies them the opportunity to consider their relationship with God and to put their trust in him. Incidentally, both Martin and Glynn were brilliant at steering a course through this minefield, giving comfort, but also a clear gospel message. So how do we avoid falling into the same sort of trap as the Thessalonian church? And as I said, the key is in Paul's statement, so then, brothers and sisters, Stand firm and hold fast to the teaching we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. Put simply, we need to know our Bibles to make God's word our foundation in a very shaky world. When we hear something on the telly, read it in the paper or on our iPads, hear it in our home groups or even in church, we need to hold it up against God's word. In Paul's first letter to Thessalonians, he says, test everything that is said, hold on to what is good. At our home group leaders meeting, Tim asked us to speak to him if we didn't agree with what he said in a sermon. And that should go for those in our home groups or with our other Christian friends. We need to look out for one another because if some of us get the wrong idea, it can spread like yeast through the whole dough. Be under no illusion, the enemy is out to deceive us, and this will hot up as we approach the end times. Again, in Matthew 24, it says, For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. The elect, that's us. And in 2 Timothy 4, it says, For the time will come when people will not put up this sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And David Pawson, if you know who he is, he says, Whenever the devil attacks the church from the outside, 
the church gets bigger and stronger. His attacks are much more successful when they come from the inside. And one of the quickest ways to do that is to pervert or corrupt or erode the gospel. If he can do that, he knows that he has destroyed the church from the inside. So today we live in a godless society. Morality and integrity have gone out the window. Jesus has been excluded from our schools, colleges, places of work, government and public bodies and broadcasting. No wonder we're in a mess. G.K. Chesterton, he said, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in everything. So that we can stand firm against this tide of ideologies and also be able to speak the truth to our friends and family and community, we need to know what God says to us in his word, the Bible. Now I realize it's not always comfortable Believing God's word to be the truth can put us at odds with society, perhaps even with our family and friends. But what do we pin our faith on if we don't have his word? Perhaps just somebody's good ideas, perhaps some random teacher that espouses what we want to hear, the latest YouTube preacher. No, we need to stand firm on his word, however difficult it might be, And we sometimes really need to wrestle with the scriptures. So how are you doing with this? How often do we open our Bibles when we are on our own? Not including preparation for home group, but just because we want to know the truth of his word for ourselves. So this hasn't been your thing. Start now to make it your thing. There are loads of ways to get started. You probably know them reading plans which you can buy or download or have emailed to you. Many, many are free. Some take just three or four minutes a day. Can you spare the time? That's the question. I've got a friend who years ago took up the challenge of her vicar to make it her New Year's resolution to start a short daily Bible reading plan. She would say it has changed her life and has been the most important thing that she has done. We really need to listen to Paul when he says we need to stand firm and hold fast to the teachings. And to do that, we need to get stuck into God's word. I just want to finish with this verse today and something to think about as we go forward into this week. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, that's us, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen.